I hope you guys read the introduction to what I'm going to speak about because it's not going to be about services 4.0. And that was my request. They said, no, they, everyone else is going to be talking about services 4.0. Can you talk more broadly about change and transformation, make it come alive? And for a lot of companies that are already in the midst of trying to make that change, talk about transformation. How do you drive a transformation? So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll introduce myself and the center in a few more slides, but I, I figured I want to start with five short videos, okay? So let's get started. Can you the volume? The volume? Sound? Hey guys, how are we doing? So we're going to go for a Sunday drive, right? Five, ten miles an hour, something like that? Alright. The Google Google drive. We are in a self-driving car. You get to hold the keyboard. Can you guys you. hear that? Wait, there's characters on here I don't recognize. Enhanced team will never believe this. Oh my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my god. <laughs> what? It's driving itself. <laughs> Have any of you guys seen this video before? This was Google's first self-driving car. So this was their first prototype. And that's on the roof of one of the Google buildings. And it's a Toyota Prius that they made into self-driving. And this video is about seven years old. But even from seven years ago, it sounds pretty amazing, right? It, it's pretty amazing to see a self-driving car. So the next video I'm gonna show is five years from that. It's about a year and a half ago. Can we run the next one? Oh wait, we can run it here. On the next one here. Oh my gosh, this is so. I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving. Whoa, whoa, the lanes are getting a little. Oh, no, there it goes, and it stops. I mean, being here in a Tesla Model S P90D with ludicrous mode, which is incredibly fun, but the fact that it can do all this itself, and you could see on here the car, the vehicle in front of you that's following, and you could see where that is in its lane. And you can see all of the sensors going back and forth on the dashboard display here. Oh my gosh, it's changing lanes on its own. Oh my gosh, it's changing lanes on its own. That is wild. So I hit the brakes there, but I didn't think I need to. I think that was me getting nervous. And the car didn't have a problem. The car was like, just watch out, there's something in front. But it was slowing down on its own. That's incredible. That's weird that, that I started freaking out before the car did. So less than five years from that first video, in a Tesla and many other cars like this, you can buy self-driving technology today. That's pretty amazing, the speed of how fast it is. And you can see from the human being, it's really hard for us to adopt to the change in technology because it's coming at you so fast. By the way, do you know how they install the self-driving car here, the self-driving capability? It's like your iPhone app, it's an app. You woke up one morning, you entered the car, you turned it on and said, would you like self-driving? You said yes. You just downloaded it and you had self-driving. That's how fast things have changed. Third video is a little bit long, but it's, uh, it's important for a different reason. Um, I, I was approached by, uh, by a friend to come build this technology for Tesla. I saw what they were doing and I'm like, I am confident with the research I've seen that I can beat them. And then one day I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna go buy a car, I'm gonna throw some cameras in it, throw some computers in it, we're just gonna make this work, done. Now ask yourself, what, what, what is self-driving, right? Um, so a lot of cars already have cruise control. In some ways cruise control is a, is a self-driving car and then some cars have adaptive cruise control which that does the uh, brake automatically. And what we're building is, is level three automation. Uh, level three automation, 99% of the time you have to do absolutely nothing except watch the car drive. And level four automation is of course when cars can drive with no people in them at all. How do you tap into the car's internal controls? Um, so we bought for $40 on Amazon Chinese can transceivers. There's actually one right there. And we can see all the messages being sent between the components. That's how we're reading the steering angle. And we can also send our own messages which are going to tell the car that. Oops, something went wrong with the video. Anyway, that uh, creepy kid that they showed, he was 26 years old, and he built a self-driving car in his own garage. Can you pause the video, please? Okay, Annie. 
Okay, good issues here. Um, 26 years old, and he built a self-driving car in his own garage in San Francisco. And what it showed was the domain of what you can do today is not limited to only the big guys. Even as a small company, as a startup, you can do this. Uh, I don't know if you caught, he said that he bought these Chinese scam transitors for like 40 bucks each and put this whole thing together. The first self-driving car I showed you, the Google one, it took about $30,000 to make it self-driving. By the time they got to the third edition, it's about $15,000. He built his co whole car for under $10,000, all the self-driving capabilities. So innovation is not limited just to big companies. That's a big, big change. And for the rest of the video, they actually show you uh, driving the self-driving car, and it's pretty incredible that a kid could build this in a garage. I'm gonna go back a few more slides. This one, quick one, oh, one before that. That one. Can you run this one? Nope. Alright, can someone help me run the one before that? There you go. Nope. <laughs> go ahead, buckle up. Okay, Annie, here we go. go. Yeah. Alright, Connie, let's go. All There's right. no steering wheel in the way. <laughs> It was a big decision for us to go and start building our purpose-built vehicles for this. And really, they're, they're prototype vehicles. They were a chance for us to, to explore what does it really mean to have a self-driving vehicle. But in the small amount of time we've been working on it, you know, we have functional prototypes, and that's exciting. So that was Google's self-driving bug. And if you noticed, there was no steering wheel. And when you don't have a steering wheel, the human being can't even control the car. So therefore, Google petitioned the National Transportation Authority to make AI a driver, and they won that. So now AI can be considered a driver, and therefore, this opened the floodgates to many other startups and companies to start building their self-driving cars as well. So that's a really big step up. And this is two years ago. These bugs have been driving around Mount Rainier for the last two years. And one last video. This is Google's car company. Is incredible. So right now, Waymo, which is Google's current uh, self-driving uh, car company, has over 600 of those vehicles driving around Phoenix in a, in a space probably larger than Singapore, giving free drives to people in a span of less than seven years. And the reason I wanted to showcase this, to start with this, was I could have shown any technology. I could have shown you AI, robotics, 3D printing, the speed of change is incredible. Now, you don't see these self-driving cars everywhere, but the technology capability is already there. We have these different curves. Technology goes fastest, then there's human beings, consumers, then there's businesses, and finally there's regulatory. It takes a while to adopt these things. So change will come fast and slow at the same time. What I'd like to talk to you about for the next 10 or 15 minutes is one, on the basis of technology, what's actually changing? How do we understand what's changing? What should we do around it? How do you take an old organization or old institution that's behaving a certain way to start behaving a different way? So I'll talk through some principles, and then I want to end with a case study that we've been working with for the last five years on how do you actually do that. A Little bit about the center. Um, I'm with a group called Center for the Edge at Deloitte. We are in uh, San Francisco, and we 
are looking around the corner. We're looking around the edge. And if you ask my consulting colleagues, you know, what drives their behavior, they'll tell you whatever, whatever keeps their clients up at night. What drives our behavior is what should be keeping your clients up at night. What's around the corner? How do we talk about that? So we do research, we do eminence, like speaking like this, we do advisory in terms of framing the future, what is it gonna look like? And then talk about, well, what, given that future, what can you do now? How do you move from here to there? So let's get started. Now, at the same time that you have all of these exponential technologies, the same time that the world is changing so fast, we saw something interesting. In the US, and I'd say globally, large companies are struggling to keep up. They are losing speed. They are falling behind. We did a study called the Shift Index, uh, 25 metrics, 40 years of data, and one of the metrics is return on assets. And without a doubt, it's a steady line. Return on assets for all public companies in the US has been declining. Similarly, uh, another one called a sh um, the, the rank shuffling of your topple rate, it's harder and harder to keep your pace. There's a professor called Dick Foster at Yale. He did a study called, uh, look at Fortune 500 companies, S&P 500. In the 20s, if you joined the S&P 500, you stayed on for about 70 years. Now, your tenure is about 15 years. So it's harder and harder to stay on top. And you ask why? The reason is the 20th century and the 21st century are fundamentally different. Now, this is a very traditional S-curve, right? Any technology starts kind of slow, it goes really fast, and then tails off. This is relatively predictable. You kind of know where to go. You can put your resources where you need to. The 21st century, all of these things we hear about, AI, blockchain, machine learning, uh, robotics, they're all stacked on top of each other, and they come much faster, and they evolve much faster. So the lived experience is exponential. You can't easily put your resources where you need to. So you have to change your behavior. Now if you put some words to this, that's the 20th century, this is the 21st century. We lived in relatively static times. Now we are in much more dynamic times. We had rigid processes. We knew where we could send things. It was all about being efficient. Now it's about all about being agile. How can you be nimble? How can you move faster? Stocks to flows. A good way to explain this is intellectual property, IP, right? IP is a stock of knowledge. You own the knowledge, you can hold on to it, you can protect it. But what's the point in getting 14 years of patent protection when the next new thing is six months away? It's much better to be in the flow of knowledge, and that's why ecosystems matter, to be in the flow of knowledge than to be in the stocks of knowledge. We're moving from closed systems to open systems. We're moving from acquiring to leveraging. How can you partner rather than try to acquire? Because by the time you acquire someone, it's too late. We're moving from push systems where you can push your resources where you need to, to pull systems where you're pulling people to work with you. The way you won the game in the 20th century was scalable efficiency. How do you scale efficiently? The way you win the game in the 21st century is scalable learning. So you've got to do all of that. The digital first companies today, they do all of that. They're dynamic, they're agile, they work in flows, they have open systems, they focus on leverage and pull. They're very much on scalable learning. All the companies that were built in the last 100 years ago, including Deloitte, we are stuck here. And moving from here to there is not easy. But it is an imperative. So given that, there's big change required, right? So how do you go from that world to this world? And you'd, you'd, you'd think it needs big investment. But we actually put a big question mark on that. Because as soon as you go after the big investment, as soon as you say, like, hey, we're going to do this giant transformation, you're putting a giant the same people in your company will come after you. We call them the antibodies. Because it's very threatening to their way. They made this company successful, and suddenly you're saying, you're going to change into something completely different. So you need an alternative. And the alternative they kind of develop around this, we call scaling engines. This is something you couldn't do 10, 20 years ago. There's another professor, Michael Tushman. He wrote a book called The Ambulance of Organization, how you need to run your core and your R&D differently. And you know, different people, different uh, economics, different incentives, all that stuff. But the problem was, his idea is you start something on the edge, and if it works, you push it into the core. It's pushing into the core that always fails, because what works out there doesn't work in the core. The DNA is fundamentally different. What's different today is the rate of technology, the growth of technology. So if you understand and recognize what I 
edge is, you can start something on the edge and you can scale it on the outside. And don't try to push it back in. Over time, you're pulling the core to the edge. So you're reversing that flow. So start something on the edge and let that scale and pull the core to the edge. There's two parts of scaling it. One is recognizing it, identifying what's that big thing you go after. The second thing is, well, how do you scale it? What are the principles? How do you grow that? So very quickly, uh, another thing. This is how we identify in the edge. It's what we call zoom on, zoom in. It's something we learned from Silicon Valley. Unlike the two to five year operational um, metrics and operational standards we go after, we're saying you need to keep two different time horizons in place. One is 10 to 20 years out, the long future. You have to have a perspective as to where the world is going and what role you're going to play in that. It's not a blueprint. It's just knowing that, hey, in the world of self-driving cars, what am I going to do? And then you want to look at 6 to 12 months. What are you going to do in the immediate future? What are you going to do now to either accelerate towards that future? Or what do you test now that will test your assumptions about that future? You ignore the two to three years. I mean, this is not the co-organization. This is the edge entity. So that's the zoom on zoom in. With the case that I'm talking about, it'll, it'll come alive. The second part is how do you scale this? So, so in our paper scaling edges, if you, if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, we have 12 design principles around scaling edges. And I'll talk to a few of these. The first one is this idea of starving the edge. Right? This goes back to the don't make it a big investment. We do this for a few reasons. The bigger the investment, the bigger the both side of back, but also it doesn't drive focus in large corporations. If you say you're going to do something big, you could spend six months just finding a way to set up an office and getting your logo. But if you're a startup, you don't think like that. Look at how startups are funded. You start with angel funding, seed funding, um, series A, series B. At each level, you get just enough funding to prove the most important thing. So it drives focus. So when you start off the edge, when you don't have enough resources, the people on the edge are very much focused on what's the most important thing you need to do right now. It, it drives the horizon, you have a long-term vision, and what do you do the next six to 12 months, right? It drives the behavior. Passion over skills. I think we overemphasize degrees, PhDs, and technical skills. Once you have the bare minimum qualification of what you need to do, we are very much focused on the passion. If you get a team together of people who are really passionate about the big idea, they'll figure out how to make it work. They'll figure out what skills they need to learn. And if they can't gain those skills, they'll connect to the people who have those skills. So passion those skills. You've got to break dependency on the core. For this entity that's on the edge, you cannot give the same rules as the main entity. You can't wait for your IT department to set up an instance six months from now. You've got to be able to go to, go to AWS and get started tomorrow. It's a different financial, different legal. You've got to give it, it's a sandbox, right? You've got to sandbox and give them, give them some space. And embracing double standards, you've got to have two sets of metrics. One set of metrics that the co-organization cares about, one set of metrics that you care about. The co-organization that's funding you, you know what they want? Top line or bottom line? So you've got to show them the metrics that matter to them, that you're either reducing costs or increasing gaining revenue. But that might not matter to you if you're trying to build a community, if you're trying to do something else. It's a different set of metrics you've got to measure for that. So two sets of metrics. I'm rushing through all this, but uh, it'll all come by with this example. So here's a company we've been working on for the last three to four years. Everyone knows Mark, right? m and sneakers, all that stuff, candy, sugar. They have a big problem. Sugar. They have a forty billion dollar business on sugar. And sugar is gonna be the next tobacco. It already is. It's gonna be really good. It's gonna be really fast. What do you do? How do you how do you move this giant ship? So we did this zoom on zoom in exercise with them, worked for all the friends, and they came up in the answer saying that they want to be a health and nutrition company. By the way, all this is in the public domain, so they're not you know, uncovering anything proprietary. And uh, health and nutrition, now that's, a, that's a long way from where they are today, right? And immediately you think, well, just shift their product portfolio to things that are healthier. And that's one part of it, but there's something more. 
If you look at technology and how it's evolved today, I can imagine 10 years from now, going up to a vending machine, scanning yourself, it'll know your DNA, because that's already been decoded, it's up in the cloud. It'll know your microbiome, because you took a dump this morning and the toilet was already kind of said how your gut is doing this morning. It'll know your goals, whether you have to gain weight, uh, gain muscle, lose weight, any of that stuff. It'll know your activity because of your walk by a smart, uh, your Fitbit or anything like that. And it'll give you the exact micro and macro nutrients that you need for that meal. Now, all of those technologies exist today. It's kind of like the autonomous cars. Every single one of those things I told you, they exist today. But they don't exist in mass and scale that you could walk up to a vending machine. But if you had that as part of your zoom on vision, what you need to do, then you can start planning and working towards that. Now Mars does not have any capabilities around this. But given this vision, there is something interesting. Now, what a lot of people don't know about Mars is not only it is a big confectionery company, it's the world's largest pet care company. They have a lot of pet food brands, like Purina. But in the US, they also own a lot of the veterinary hospitals. Now, pets, unlike humans, are interesting. There's no food brand that we eat that's more than 5% of what we eat intake. For pets, 70 to 100% is one brand. Because we buy a giant bag of food and just feed the same thing to them. So you know what goes in. Because of the veterinary hospitals, you know how they're behaving in the long term. Given this long term mission, they bought a pet favorite company called Whistle, they bought a pet microbiome company, and they bought a pet DNA company. And the pet side is much less regulated than the human side. So now they have lots of data scientists that are building the pillars and the platforms and knowledge and learning on the pet side, which over time they can apply to the human side towards the future. And that's only one of many things. They've got a few other issues how do they work with uh, ecosystems, how do you become the Mars inside, kind of like Intel inside, so all these things. So it's hard to do this in 15 minutes. I was rushing through a lot. But uh, just to recap, we do live in exponential times. I don't think we have to convince people of that anymore, but things are moving much faster than you think. Transformation is an imperative. It's not a choice anymore. And in Singapore, it's, it's, it's incredible to see how Singapore itself is trying to make this transition and build. Scaling agents, this idea of starting something in the scaling that, is kind of an option to do that. And that requires you to have two things. One is zoom out, like have this long term vision. Where is the world going? What's your role in that world? And zooming in to focus on the immediate term, right? What can you do right now to test that? And um, it's a question. Times are great disruption, all the times are great opportunity. All the startups, they see the opportunity. All of the big guys, they see disruption. So, which side do you want to be on? I'll be here for the rest of the day. Uh, please get in touch with me, and I hope this is useful, even though it's not about services for one. Thank you.